Hi everyone, my name's Kate Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the programmers here at MIF. We're really excited to have been able to present First Cow as our opening night film. And we're thrilled to have Kelly Reichardt here with us tonight for a Q&A. Hi Kelly, how are you going? I'm doing well, thanks. First Cow can be viewed as a timely piece of filmmaking, but I understand that you read the John Raymond novel over 10 years ago. Can you talk about the process? Sure. Um, uh, it was the first thing I read of John's. Uh, and after reading it, I I wrote him and um, asked him if he had any short projects, that, something I could sort of get my arms around because the half-life is spans four decades and there's a ocean voyage to China. And it's a, uh, it was way beyond my reach. Um, I had like $30,000 to make a movie. So um, he sent me uh, Old Joy and that was the first project we did together. And then throughout the years, we. Um, I've always been asking him sort of not to give anyone else the half-life because I quite love it. And, um, and that one day I'd figure out how to do it. And, and somehow we're always musing over it. And then we, um, uh, you know, First Cow doesn't have a, the half-life doesn't have a cow in it. And so once we came up with the cow, that became our sort of way to um, narrow down the scope of the novel and bring in all the themes and the characters of the novel, but do it in a much uh, sort of minute kind of way. Because that's quite interesting because you, I mean, the William Blake quote at the beginning of the film, which references specifically friendship, human friendship, um, this is a central theme of First Cow. It's um, also quite interesting that you often look at kind of unlikely friendships or uh, unusual alliances like uh, Wendy and the the car park attendant security guard that's a really beautiful friendship um, in makes cut off Will Michelle Williams character and the indigenous man and even Cookie and King Lou could be seen as quite an unlikely friendship if they hadn't been thrown together in those circumstances is that uh, something interesting for you to explore those kind of unlikely friendships yeah well I think in uh can you hear this crow? He's been driving me crazy for like two weeks. I don't oh. know if you can hear him. He's so <laughs> loud. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, well, in Wendy and Lucy, uh, and I think throughout the films, um, you know, people do have uh, this relationship with strangers, which I think touches on a theme that's in a lot of um, John Raymond's writing, which is this question of uh, what we owe to each other as uh, people in a community or in a country or, you know, just um, on the planet together. Is there um, something that where we should be helping each other a bit more? And, um, and so these connections happen with strangers. Um, I mean, with First Cow, I really wanted to make a film about friendship. Uh, the novel sort of goes between 1980 and then back to the early 1800s and is flowing back and forth. And we just chose to go with um, just the, obviously the 1820s. But um, it really, I kept the quote, which is in the novel, because I really wanted to remind myself with all the other sort of themes going on that I was making a film about friendship. Um, which seemed really somehow right at this point in life of, um, you know, uh, making films with this, with a group of people for a decade with, where I'm working with a lot of the same people uh, again and again and uh, teaching in a place for a decade. It seemed like a, um, a good moment and to, uh, yeah, it sort of express that, um, that yeah, friendship is sort of where it's at. You often have uh, depictions of uh, humans' relationship with animals um, throughout your films, Wendy and Lucy, um, also in Certain Women and obviously First Cow. Um, what, what do you think we can learn from those relationships? Like, uh, is that a, an important thing for you? Well, I think they're, diff you know, I, they act as sort of, um, comfort companions in a lot of ways in the films and uh, uh, sort of um, grounding relationships for uh, people that are in, you know, in uh, 
certain women, uh, the rancher who's quite uh, off by herself, she has the company of the horses and her dog and uh, Wendy and Lucy, you know, her sort of comfort and balance is her dog. So um, the whereas the relationships with people are much, they're harder, <laughs> um, they're more complicated and the characters are not as necessarily um, as well spoken as I am, uh, they're not actually um, having an easy time of it. So the, um, yeah, the animals are there to, uh, they're just a sort of a kind of simpler intimacy. Same in First Cow, you know, someone uh, like Cookie, who's really a very down to earth character and he is not really fitting in in his element with the um, men of the, in, in the new world. And, uh, but then, you know, it's an easy time with the cow. You clearly have a deep connection with the land and the landscape, particularly of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and you, you showcase it so beautifully in, in all of your films in lots of different ways from like the um, kind of uh, expansive mix cut off to the verdant green of, of First Cow. Do you think you're subtly trying to remind your audience that this is a beautiful place and we need to be mindful of, of looking after it? Um, not, uh... Well, as far as Oregon goes, <laughs> or the Northwest, no, I don't. I don't want anyone else to move here. So it's a horrible place, actually. Um, well, no, I mean, I don't really have, there's not a message in anything, really. It is just more about questions. And we really, I, I really try not to have, in fact, it's a rule that there can't be any beauty shots. There can be no shots just for the sake of beauty. Like everything, the landscape has to work in every shot. Um, and so, but it is about man's footprint in, uh, in the natural world, for sure. You know, I think something that draws me to John's writing is that he's concerned and I'm concerned certainly with um, really the small politics uh, and, and just how, um, who gets power and uh, who feels entitled to what and who, um, is left out and uh, what are the systems that get set up really early that help decide who's in and who's out and who does it serve. Um, and so, uh, I mean, these are really like 1820s really early days where uh, the Chinook are, I think, not even as wary as maybe they should be of, um, you know, like there's trade going on at this point, at this early moment. Um, can you talk about the casting of your two leads? I found it interesting to learn that um, King Lou particularly is a, I, I think is a mix of two characters from the book. He became, in the script he became, yeah, it, these two characters from the novel got fused together um, to become King Lou, um, who's played by Orion Lee. And, um, and that, you know, Cookie was sort of always Cookie and he was sort of a little bit easier to imagine. And uh, I love John Magaro and I was so pleased to be able to imagine him in the part. Um, and uh, and King Lou was more, it was it, the casting director here, um, Gail Keller's her name, she searched high and low for King Lou. I mean, we really, it was a, uh, we saw hundreds of people and Orion Lee sort of kept reading because it was a, sort of, you know, a discovery for me of like, who exactly is King Lou and what does he sound like? And uh, Orion did several readings for me over a certain amount of months. And uh, so, it, you know, it's just, a, we were coming to figure it out sort of together, like, who is this? Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I mean, it was so much work that I can't say it was good luck finding him because that seems unfair to Gail Keller, but it seems like such good luck to have found him. <laughs> There's a really strong presence of uh, Native American characters in the film in a prominent position. Can you talk about how you integrated that culture and community into the film production? Sure. Um, I, the uh, Chinook and the Multnomah tribes that lived along the Columbia River, um, you know, I'm introducing the Columbia at the beginning um, with the Alia Shawkat because I 
just trying to get across a that commerce is still happening on the Columbia River and was happening back then. It's been a trading sort of highway for uh, cars come in on these barges and such now. Um, so uh, and also just to give us a place like this is the place. Um, and the uh, so we we worked. Um, it was part of our research here. It was part of what was the really rewarding and um, fun research. When we started, it happened that a museum uh, south of Oregon had just opened up called the Grand Ronde. And uh, we started visiting there and um, nudging our way in uh, amongst the people that run the place. And they eventually opened their library to us and um, pointed us in some directions, being hands off and but nudging us in places where we could find the answers. And, um, and you know, it just sort of the whole crew is researching at once. Uh, April Napier, the costume designer, um, found the woman who could do the cedar capes as the Chinook war. And then her, you know, we get her family stories and they're, um, we, uh, the language that they're speaking is a jargon. It's a trading language that the Chinook, uh, used called Wawa and um, and so learning the language and finding people that could teach us the language and we got a lot of support from um, this confederation of tribes near outside of Eugene Oregon and they uh, ended up lending us the dugout canoe that's in the film um, but they haven't seen the film yet so they're not responsible for anything that I got wrong in the movie by any measure but uh, it was cool we made all these new friends and um it was just great it was fun we learned a lot, a lot of things that aren't in the film also like how to um, make an acorn polenta in the sand and just um it was a real like the whole crew getting a going through a um crash course crash course and uh sharing information with each other and um yeah it was uh that was definitely a highlight your roots in filmmaking can be linked to the American avant-garde and you yourself have made a, a lot of experimental short work um, and it, it seems to um, speak to how you work independently now. How important is it to you to have that kind of independent ownership of your work? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't, um, I mean, what's in a name, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I am very much a narrative filmmaker. I've, I've I've tried over time sometimes to get away from narrative, but I just, my brain doesn't work that way and I'm not successful at it. But um, I have been able to, um, uh, well, like with all films, you're working with, uh, you have partners and um, people are putting so much of themselves into the films. And, uh, and so there's these great collaborations that go on all the way through the process. But I have, um, been able to work in a small way uh, because that's what we've been able to do. But uh, the other side of that is that I've had just kind of pure autonomy, um, uh, you know, uh, aside from sometimes in casting, but mostly, you know, it's like we go off and make the work and I go to my edit room and cut it. And at the end, we're like, oh, here's a film. And it's been, uh, it's been a very lucky thing to be able to work that way. And, um, yeah, that's, yeah, but now, I, yeah, I, I mean, I've been, I've learned how to make films that way. I'm very spoiled. <laughs> the music in your films is, is quite precise, um, like, and quite varied, like anything from Yola Tango in Old Joy to literally just Michelle Williams humming in Wendy and Lucy. And the, the music in, in First Cow is, is so beautiful and evocative and complements the tone of the film. So well, is, is the music something that you think about from the outset or is it something that comes to mind more once the film, once the film process is done, the filmmaking is done? Yeah, usually sometimes before like, uh, with Wendy and Lucy, I knew I was gonna sort of use the trains as a score sound. So I was, had an ear open to, like you always keep an ear open to what's available to see what sounds are happening. Um, in the desert and meets cut off there's some crazy sounds i would have never expected that we were able to riff off of in the um jeff grace was who did the score um but 
more of a focus happened. So there's ideas maybe, but uh, it, especially with First Cow, I went really far in the cutting before I had any score. And I tried a lot of different things and tried working with period music that just didn't feel right. And then um, William Tyler uh, came to my editing room and actually played along with cut scenes and we recorded him and it worked really nicely. It came with a dulcimer and some guitars and we spent three days doing that. And then I worked with that as a scratch track and then he re-recorded stuff. So, but that came at the end of a long process of searching until I found uh, that just was wonderful that that worked out. And it was sort of an immediate thing of knowing like that I, you know, thought that it would work nicely. Um, but I went down some dead end roads first. Also the costume design in the film is quite meticulous. Can you talk about the process of, of getting all that together as well and getting that just so? Yeah, uh, April Napier was the uh, costume designer and she's incredible. The, um, the actors would come and it was seriously like they went through a time machine and came out. And it was a long process of, um, April was willing to start really early and just was scavenging and sending me images, images every night, like at the end of everything else. It was such a delight to go to the April files and just be able to, you know, it's like paper dolls. Like I'll take this shirt with this jacket and da, 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 da. But um, she's quite an artist and um, it was seriously uh, uh, with every extra we, you know, we, we found, we decided on backgrounds for all, I, I hate the word extra because they're, everyone's really kind of key. So we came up with stories for everybody. We had these sort of different categories of sailors and trappers and people that would have worked at the fort and whatever. And um, so just to give April some idea of what would sort of be in their, uh, not anybody, nobody had a closet, so not in their closet, but my, what, you know, and Cookie too, like, what did he find along the way? What did he leave home with? How did he, so, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, fabulous, yeah, really a lot of hard, hard work, and um, just, uh, as you said, she's a very detailed person, and, uh, and I should mention the production designers, Tony Gasparro, uh, who also, fabulous to work with. And um, Chris Blavelt, who, the cinematographer, um, who I've shot quite a few, made quite a few movies with, and uh, a lot of movies with, and uh, is a fabulous collaborator and like... Yeah, that yeah. was actually going to be my next question was in regards to, to that relationship um, and also to kind of... Um, Talk more about why your decision to shoot the film in 4-3. I mean, I'm sort of just drawn to that shape. And uh, so it's always more the question, like, are we going to shoot? You know, like just there are payoffs to not shooting in a square shape as now, like a pandemic comes in your film goes straight to TV and which is shaped into like a rectangle. Um, so, but um, I do really love the frame and it works for a film like this where, you know, you're in a forest, so you're just, Everything is like these tall trees, planks in the uh, hutches, everything. There's all these vertical lines we're working with. And so, you know, you get more at the top and the bottom. And also, it's a very intimate frame and sort of really helps you to just be right in there with the characters. Um, it was practical. Sometimes it allowed me to shoot the scene the way I wanted to shoot it with the men on the hill and Cookie hiding down below. Like I couldn't have done that in a wider frame. So um, it's kind of my inclination. I like the shape, um, but yeah, but it, it, it seemed um, particularly right for this film also. You've described the film in the past as a kind of heist film. Um, I'd say maybe a very gentle heist film. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Well, people are always calling it a Western, so I'm just like, if it has to be a genre film, I, you know, it's more of a heist. Um, it's a caper, there's a caper, uh, uh, which is fun. The caper part of it uh, is pretty fun to um, figure out. It's sort of where I get to do my work in the script, where um, figuring out how to, um, make the moments happen and build and what characters to add so that I can uh, 
like the scene in the back of the chief factor's house. Um, you know, how, uh, just, yeah, it's fun. Cause you know, like where something's going exactly. And it's, um, it's maybe not like the deepest part of the work, but it's, um, it's strategic and, uh, uh, you know, I, I teach film. So, you know, I, I it's like, it's kind of, um, paint by numbers in a way, but you're trying to do it in a way that's new for your film and, you know, specific to these people in this moment, in this location, this time of night. And it's just, but it's like figuring out a puzzle and it's quite fun actually. So, but uh, yeah, there's some caper in there. Uh, there's running and hiding and... <laughs> how, how difficult or easy was it to cast the cow? Casting, like ultimately finding her was, I mean, I'm saying it's so easy. I got pictures sent to me. There's people on the ground looking for the cow. So I shouldn't say how. It was so easy. Um, but uh, I, like first it was just they were sending me types of cows and um, and then the Jersey cow was like a small cow that would have existed at the time with those big doughy eyes. And then I just looked at cow headshots until we saw Evie and then obviously Evie was so beautiful and great. It was very superficial, the whole like she wasn't too big and she had beautiful eyes and so we, we cast her. And, um, but working with animals is challenging for sure, you know, especially, um, you know, like a cow it, or like horses, you're just, you, you, the crew has to really do a lot of things that are, uh, really go against the instincts of a crew, which is always like loud and fast and in the most hurried way and clunky. And, um, and it takes like you, we have to sort of retrain ourselves to um, slow down and learn to work in quiet ways without talking and everything to not scare the cow and, and become invisible basically. Um, and so it's, uh, it's challenging, but it, then, you know, whenever you're not shooting, it's so fun to have like a big cow around or whoever the animals are, but um, yes. Chris Blavo, you could put him in any situation, in any weather, in anything, and he's just rolls with it. But as soon as he start, as soon as we were dealing with animals, his kids were. He's like, what, what are we doing this for? <laughs> you kind of, you, you really kind of touched on this earlier, but yeah, I was keen to um, ask about the the opening shot with Alia Shawcat and the dog. Um, and so it's, it's got this root in the present, like how important was it for you to connect the story with the present day? Uh, I think it's important. I just used it as a prologue, as I said, in the, in the novel, it, uh, John's going back and forth in time. And, and we could have just made the movie just about the part that takes place in the nineties between the two young girls, but, um, I love cookies so much, you know, I just wanted to do the, whatever, I wanted to do the period part. But um, I did think it was important just as far as the environment and all goes to show, uh, you know, the difference of the then and now and um, uh, in the soundscape, you know, uh, you know, the planes and the trains so that you could get to a place of quiet, um, and uh, yeah, and just to, um, I really liked, I mean, one of the favorite things in the novel is the connection of, into the modern world and the discovery that Alia makes. Um, so uh, the Alia character, <laughs> who we called Alia. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it for just as far as place and um, just, again, even though it's, a beach and all it, it's uh, sonically you hear the um you hear the traffic you hear the planes you the barge is coming down the river um and so that was all uh seemed uh kind of necessary to me um and that opening shot of the barge is really an ode to my um beloved colleague and friend peter hutton the american filmmaker landscape marine time filmmaker um but uh that was just a bonus 
It's a nice dedication. It's possible that this old friend of mine uh, that I met working on Todd Haynes' film Poison. Oh, wow, I love that film. Yeah, I worked in the art department with uh, my friend Sarah Stolman, who went to Melbourne afterwards to work on a movie and never came back. And perhaps she's seeing the film tonight. And if she is, I want to say hello to Sarah. <laughs> I hope she is. <laughs> Thanks so much for talking to me, Kelly. It's been a real honor. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope you all uh, stay safe there.